You guys, something really cool just happened. I had the opportunity to speak with co-owner, co-founder, and chef of Hudson Valley Foie Gras, Michael Guinor, alongside the very talented chef Lenny Messina of Lola Restaurant. Hudson Valley Foie Gras has been around since the early 80s. They're coined as the farm who sort of brought foie gras production to the United States. Their foie gras, their products are super high quality. These guys are super cool. I had a great time talking with them. I think you're gonna learn a lot. So if you're here to learn more about foie gras production uh, and just kind of shoot the shit about foie gras, you've come to the right place. For um, your interest in uh, a product that's so close to our hearts. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I. I should know, say close to our livers, but okay. <laughs> both probably, right? They kind of both make sense. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. so, uh, first off, thank you for your time and thank you for um, for agreeing to hop on the call here. Um, you guys have been ultra helpful. Your your foie gras product that I've worked with is like insanely high quality, insanely delicious. Um, well, you know, it's not every day I get two chefs on the call here to be able to like sort of like pick your brains and talk for like, you know, technicalities of foie gras. So I got to start with some some opening culinary questions here. Um, and I know it's kind of the uh, I don't know, at least my worst nightmare is, is a food person when somebody asks me what my favorite way or favorite thing is to do anything. Um, but I guess I would I want to start this off by asking what your favorite sort of traditional way to prepare foie gras is, uh, whether it be torchon, whether it be anything like that. So. Uh, how do you, what would you do, like, from a traditional standpoint, like, what's your go-to? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, I would, I'll start by saying that the nice thing about foie gras is foie gras itself, the, it, I think the biggest compliment you can give a product is that the less you do to it, the better off you are. And that in, in all honest truth, no matter what foie gras preparation you're looking at, mm -hmm. the foie gras itself is very straightforward, as mm -hmm. in whether it's a, uh, thank you, whether it's a... Um, I, I guess you would divide foie gras into two types of cooking, high heat and low heat. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, high heat cooking would be 350 degrees and above, and that would be served hot. That would include grilling, searing, roasting, and so on. Um, so you would sear a piece of foie gras. Uh, it's the simplest preparation in the world. You don't even, it's, it's easier than eggs because you don't even need butter. You just take a pan, get it to high heat, sear the foie on each side for 30 to 40 seconds, and then serve it with whatever, just about. And, uh, and it, it's, it's as simple as that. It's got enough fat in it where you don't need to add more fat. Uh, and those are all served uh, hot. Then the other side, which is a little more complicated uh, and even and, and, and still unadulterated, is the uh, low heat preparations, which are served cold, as you mentioned, pâtés, tureens, torchons, uh, and so on. And, um, and those are a little more complex in the sense that they're a little more technically skilled. But again, the less you, you really don't add anything, a little salt, a little pepper, possibly a little uh, cognac or armagnac, you marinate the foie, you cook it, you send it out. It's very, very straightforward. So, um, the, so which leads to say that, again, the best, the more a product is manipulated, the less really the quality of the product in a sense, because you don't need to coax flavor out of it or into it. It's, 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 it's standalone. It's, it's a great product. Now, of course, you can accompany it with acidity, whether it's a, uh, just to accentuate the natural unctuousness of it, but even that's not necessarily, but like a nice jam or a nice pepper sauce or a nice, uh, you know, citrusy sauce would just enhance the quality of the foie gras, but it's not totally needed. You could take a nice Torino foie gras and spread it on a nice country toasted bread like butter with a little sea salt and you're good to go. So, yeah. so that's a, a big compliment for the product. Um, the other thing I'll add while we're at it is that what makes us so proud to be associated with Foie Gras is that if you look at at all of the, if you think of all of the luxury food products that come to mind, uh, you would think of things like truffles, caviar, lobster, all of those have a, a, a great, a much shorter history as being a luxury food item than does Foie Gras. Foie Gras, as you probably know from your initial research, dates back to the days of the pharaohs. Um, it was always the food of the pharaohs and the kings and the queens and, and royalty, if you will. Uh, truffle have a decent history, 500 years or so, but caviar, lobster, all those other products are maybe 150 years as a luxury food, where for a guy stretches back 5,000 years. So, so it's got an illustrious history as being, you know, the food of the gods. Um, and uh, as far as, to get back to your question, um, it's funny, when I started learning about foie gras, which is over 30 years ago. And when I, when I first encountered it at a very simple taverna-like restaurant in Israel, the foie gras was basically, Israel 
Israel was a big foie gras producer. Um, really? That's interesting. 90, yes. Well, it's interesting. It's, it kind of makes sense in a sense, because first of all, there's a strong relationship between Judaism and foie gras in a sense that in Hungary wow. and in Germany, uh, foie gras was a substitute for pork, where pork was not available because of dietary kosher laws. Uh, duck was a very, very good, rich source of fat. So in a sense, uh, fat at uh, duck is the closest, in a, in a sense, uh, product, protein to pork, because it's got that sort of same feel of richness and fat, and it was considered highly nutritious. And so uh, for duck would be often fed to the kids, to the young kids as a form of fat, and as you know, things like schmaltz, which are the chicken fat, or duck schmaltz. fat. So so when the, the goys, the Gentiles, were having pork, <laughs> the Jews would be having duck. So there is a strong relationship oh. between between Judaism and duck as a luxury food product. Now, um, further can, I, can that, I interject for, for one moment? Sure. W w just a quick question. You said, the um, w is that so sort of after the pharaohs, after the Romans, in the Middle Ages, was that when when the Jewish people sort of started consuming foie more and more? Or was it sort of just like throughout time? As far You're as exactly right. It became, a, I would say, a much bigger project in the, in, in the Ashkenazi Eastern Europe that included things like Hungary, uh, Germany, Czechoslovakia, and that would be more in the mid 1800s. Wow, I had no idea, okay, cool. Yeah, and so so duck was a very popular source of both nutritious fat and also that, you know, feel good kind of situation. It was goose and duck were like uh, holiday foods. They were never inexpensive, but, and it would often be given to the kids as, as a form of, you know, let's get our, you know, Jewish kids a little fatter situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, the combination, now Israel is a very small country, so land is at a value. Mm -hmm. um, so the more you can gener generate agriculturally from a piece of land, the more likely you are to find it in Israel. So where you, if you take a, an acre of land and you plant corn, you're only going to produce so much. But if you take an acre of land and you raise ducks, especially for foie gras, your revenue is significantly higher. So, so Israel, from an agricultural standpoint, started tending more and more to find things that are high, high revenue for a little bit of land. And so uh, as, fr as France and Hungary and other countries, uh, uh, mostly France, had high demand for foie gras and not enough supply, Israel was, uh, was advanced enough technically to start producing foie gras for export to France. So Israel developed quite a thriving foie gras industry um, where 90% of the foie gras was exported to France. Um, and, and, and so traditionally, when you look at foie gras, you're looking at A, B, and C grades. The A grade, the B grade, the higher grades would be exported to France. Uh, the C grade would actually stay within Israel and in meeting Israeli you know, traditional cultural uh, culinary tradition, it would often be skewered and grilled over coals and served that way. And sure. so it's found a place to a whole bunch of taverna-like restaurants um, where the offerings were meze, hummus, and pita, and trina, and baba ganoush, and all that, alongside a variety of skewered meats, kebabs, lamb, beef, hearts, gizzards, uh, sweetbreads, and foie gras. And so when I was in Israel as a student in the uh, for my third year abroad in the early 80s, um, uh, we went out to dinner once and my father said, no, we're going to go to this restaurant your mother likes. It's a taverna. They, they're known for duck liver. And I was like, oh, OK. And we went and I thought it was the best thing I've ever had. And that started my personal fascination with foie gras. And, and uh, there it was just a simply cubed. You took the foie gras, cubed it, seasoned it, skewered it, and literally grilled it over hot wood coals and served it literally with hummus and pita. And I thought it was the greatest thing ever. So I do have a place in my heart for that style of preparation, whereby you literally grill it on a skewer uh, and serve it very straightforward. However, as I have, as my palate has developed with foie gras, and I'm finding that to be true, not just for myself, but for people who are experienced with foie gras, um, I'm at a point now where I can only eat the hot seared foie gras, whether it's grilled, seared, roasted, every so often. However, a terrina foie gras, a well-made terrina foie gras, where a foie gras is just deveined, marinated, and then 
cooked at a low temperature and formed. Um, it, it's the closest thing, let's say, to a pat of butter. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. taking a nice tomato foie gras, spreading it on nice grilled country toast with salt, that I could eat probably every single day. It's kind of like eating butter. You, you, you never wake up in the morning and say, butter, oh my God, no, I can't do that anymore. Or cream cheese, right? You can technically have I have yet day. to. I have yet to. <laughs> right. So same with a terrine. I can literally, so I, I guess what I'm saying is when I first discovered foie gras, when my palate for it was less sophisticated and it was still new to me, um, I loved the grilled hot seared preparations. And I'm finding that to be true with most people. Most, in the United States, uh, I would say 70% of foie gras is hot, high heat cooked, hot served. So classically it would be a seared foie gras with a fig jam or or a steak topped with seared foie gras and then a poivre brandy sauce and so on. 30% uh, is probably sold in the form of torchons, terrines, pâtés. And there's a few reasons for that. I think the the palate, the American palate is a little less sophisticated than the European one in a certain sense when it comes to foie gras. Mm -hmm. um, so for a lot of people, it's a first time experience and they're more comfortable with steak-like preparation, just a sear, sure. where the terrine is a little more of an acquired taste. But uh, for me, on a personal level, um, and you'll find that in France is the reverse. In France, probably 70% of foie gras is eaten in the form of ter terrines and torchons and maybe 30% is hot, and, and more often not in a restaurant. Here, we're still at that point where we're still, we're converting, more and more people are discovering mousse and torchons and terrines. But like I said, a hot preparation, I can have every so often, and I still enjoy it. But a nice, perfectly done terrine or torchon, um, the difference being kind of semantics, a terrine is, is baked where a torchon is poached, um, I can probably have every single day. Lenny, do you, how do you feel? What do you think? I, I agree. I mean, I love the caramelization and the nuttiness that it gets accentuated with the seared preparation, but uh, I find myself more loving. I'm, I've been really into just making terrines lately and just minimally seasoned white pepper, salt, a little bit of cognac, just press, yeah. beautiful, some, something about it that's just brings it to, into the next stratosphere that I love. Yeah. I'm going to add that, you know, to, we, Lenny and I could wake up in the morning and decide on a seared dish and run it tonight as a special. Meaning mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have the foie gras around, we slice it, we sear it, and then we just have to figure out what we want to put on the plate. It could be a, you know, right now we're in rhubarb season. So the other day we made a, um, and when I say we, really it was more Lenny than me, but I'm, I'm always an inspiration. Um, so Lenny made uh, a nice compote, if you will, of rhubarb and, um, and um, strawberry. We hit it with a little bit of basil oh, and, uh, and a beautifully, you know, fat, uh, rendered a duck fat brioche, toasted brioche. We seared the foie. We had it done in, we, we were running tasting menus. We literally had a tasting menu come in and we whipped it out in about a minute. And we just seared the foie and we, we had a dish going. That's when it awesome. Comes to a terrine, when it comes to a terrine and a torchon, it's really a three-day process. So it's not as intuitive in the sense that you got to decide in three days, yeah. I'm going to run this special and so on. It's not as quick. So chefs are chefs are very, you know, quick to work sometimes. So a seared foie gras is easier in that sense. A terrine, you have to, you have to bring the foie gras in, you've got to devein it, you have to marinate it, you let it sit overnight, then you've got to bake it off, you got to press it to get the fat out, you got to cool it, and then you got to serve it. So literally, if we decided to do a terrine or a tarchon today, we probably wouldn't have it going till Wednesday or Thursday. You and so inevitably, it. inevitably, it's more of a cognitive process and um, less common in, in a sense. Gotcha. But there's nothing like it. To me, um, a, a well-executed terrine foie gras uh, or, or a variation of it, for example, smoked tongue terrine with foie gras or uh, rillette and foie gras, or duck confit and foie gras terrine, all that Ooh. whole class of, um, of product is amazing. Now, there's always a, there's somewhat of a misconception in a sense that when when you say to someone, oh, we produce foie gras, they say, oh, pâté. And, and people often associate foie gras with being pâté. By definition, pâté means that there's a pork element. So it's generally like a force meat, like a, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it could be maybe 80% pork and 20% foie gras, or 90% pork and 10% foie gras. It could be chicken, pork, and foie gras. So when you say the word pâté, by definition in, in France, that means mm -hmm. there's a, 
a pork a element pork or something element in, in to it. it. And then the quantity of foie gras in there can be anything from higher to lower. Gotcha. Um, so so uh, we are not in the business of pâté de foie gras. Pâté de foie gras just means that there is an element of foie gras in there. Sure. Uh, but a Torino or Torchon would be 100%, generally 100% foie gras. Cool. Well, so I want to touch back on something that you said earlier. You were talking about how, you know, searing the foie is, is as easy as slicing into it, hitting it over, maybe scoring it, then hitting it over high heat and serving it with some sort of a compote. When you slice into the lobe itself, right, you detach the smaller from the larger. Yeah. Um, do you Are you worried about cleaning foie when you slice it for searing? Are you worried about no, splitting it open? That, so basically – um, as we said, there are two classes of preparations, high heat mm -hmm. and low heat. Mm -hmm. The high heat being above 350, the low heat being below. Any preparation that's a high heat preparation is going to take whatever blood or vein might be in the foie and basically get rid of it. Oh. In a low heat preparation, okay. you need to do veins. So, for example, if you're going to make a terrine or a torsion, it's critical that there's no blood spots. And the way you that's would do that is... Depending on the quality of the foie gras, back in the day, the foie gras was not as good a quality. So you'd find some recipes calling for soaking it in milk. The milk was a natural way to that. draw any blood or other obnoxious, you know, things from the liver. Uh, that's a technique that's sometimes adopted. I mean, chicken liver and calf's liver, which are inherently less clean or less fatty, you know, that technique is applied to that as well. And then it was inherited by foie gras. Gotcha. Um, we don't find that necessary. But yes, if you're going to do a, a Torino Torchon, it's kind of important to use a high-grade foie gras that's going to have less veins to begin with. And then you have to bring the foie gras to room temperature. You have to separate uh, the lobes. And then, you know, fairly gently trying to not destroy the foie gras completely, you would devein it, marinate it, and go from there to either a mousse, a Torchon, or a Torino. When it comes to a seared slice, uh, again, you take the foie, you... Um, you 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 separate the two lobes. If there's any really big obnoxious veins right there, you could pull them, but I, I wouldn't pull them from within the foie because it's going to cause holes in the liver itself. Um, and at that point, you want to use a warm knife. You have to when you work with foie gras, you got to think of it like ice cream. You know, when you take an ice cream scoop, you yeah. kind of put it in warm water because if you if the foie gras is too cold, so you want to let the foie gras you would temper it and it's room come temperature towards or... room. Yeah. And you want to use a warm knife. That will gotcha. give you a nice okay. uh, medallion as opposed to cutting with a cold knife through a cold foie that's going to kind of shred it a little bit and not give you a nice clean cut. Once you get your medallion, which should be somewhere between a half inch to three quarters inch in thickness, okay. um, you would not devein it because that would cause holes. And at that point, you would season it well, um, certainly with salt. Um, whether you use black pepper is a matter of opinion. Some people find it, it, it kind of murks the surface of the liver. Some people love it for flavor, so it's a matter of taste. Um, and you mentioned scoring before. Um, you know, you'll often find duck and foie gras scored. The reason you score a duck is because the duck breast, is because you want to render the skin down. You want to slowly cook it on the skin side. You want it to render and you want it to crisp up. With foie gras, um, it's often confused as a culinary technique. It's not. It's really for appearance sake. Uh, you don't need to score the foie for technical reasons. You just score it because of um, of the appearance uh, of it when you when you sear it. It's going to have that sort of like checkered look, yeah, and people like pretty. that. So that's why you sear it. I'm on the fence sometimes with whether it should be scored or not. Sure. Um, and if you do score it, you should only score one side. Because again, it's a visual effect, not a mm -hmm. technical effect. So, and that you're only going to be seeing one side. And the other thing that's important is um, is to season it well. You know, for it's a liver; it will only absorb so much salt. So you should uh, you 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 can over season then under season. So seasoning is important. It's easy to under season, but it's not it's but it's hard to over season. So you know you be you have to be generous with you know the salt from high up and um, and I would say, you know, it's, uh, searing foie gras is very, very simple, and the sins are overcooking. And that's because then you're paying a lot of money for foie, and you lose all your gras. So, so <laughs> you, you got to make sure you don't overcook. Now, how do you overcook? You overcook by either slicing a medallion that's too thin, and at that point, when you, when you cook it, you're going to lose a lot of fat. So you got to stick with that half inch to three quarters. 
Two is by cooking in for too long, obviously, at which point you cook out a lot of the fat. And three is by cooking at too high a temperature. Now, you want to cook it fairly high, but you don't want to scorch it and so on. Um, so those are the three sins. And as long as you, you can get away with undercooking foie gras to some degree, mm -hmm. but if you overcook it, you, just, <laughs> you, you, you kill it. Gotcha. So make sure the thick the medallion is the right thickness and uh, that you don't overcook. It's a 30 to 40 seconds per side. And it's a, at a high pan, but not a crazy smoking point. Right on, right on. Well, I'm going to apply all of what you just said to uh, my technique when I film that here in a couple of days. <laughs> So, awesome. yeah, I'm going to make like a nice port, port mustard sauce. It's going to be killer. But thank you. So I think what, we, we, I'm sorry? what was that? What are you making? I'm just going to make like a, like a port mustard reduction and just like hit it over the top. Maybe serve with some chives, seared quad, nice and simple. You know, like nice, like sweet, sweet sort of like soury sauce, like in a sense. But again, uh -huh. mostly focusing on well, the Well, you know, I mean, just for you to think about it, it's spring. Mm -hmm. um, and so rhubarb is a really nice way to go too. Oh, cool. Um uh, um, and uh, like a rhubarb jam would be great with a terrine or a torsion light yeah, okay. product. Um, did we send you a terrine or anything like that? No, no, no. I actually I made one with a friend um, a couple days back, so I have it actually in there. And I filmed ah. that yesterday, and I served it with a with like a blueberry compote type situation. Oh, perfect. Um, it perfect. was a uh, yeah. It was it, it turned out really nicely. I'll I'll show you guys a picture. But um, awesome. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I loved oh. it. It was great. So we addressed a lot of like really great culinary stuff there. We hit a lot um, more great points than I thought we'd get around to. So that's awesome. Um, I'd like to move more into the actual uh, the process of, of, of the farming and the raising of the animals because it's kind of no, hard no, to make no. a video. No, no, no. That's off subject. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you were like, come in, I guess. I guess I got to come um, into the farm for one of your tours. But so before before we go on, just to kind of keep it a little a little targeted and then we can go off and, and talk about whatever it is that – that you think is worth talking about, but I'm just, I'm trying to, so basically I'm just trying to share like with the audience sort of like what a good foie gras farm looks like and how it, you know, how, how the process of a gavage isn't, am I pronouncing that right? Gavage? Yes. Okay. Yep. Gavage a is a French word for hand feeding or. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's yeah. start from there, I guess. Uh, could you just describe a little bit about, um, I guess the, the, the life cycle of one of the animals on your farm, um, when you start feeding them, when you stop feeding them, and uh, you know anything else that you want to touch on along the way would be great. Sure, you can ask questions in so, between. So, um, I, I guess I would have to say if there's uh, if there are ever two objections brought up to foie gras, one would be nutritional, as in oh my god, it's so bad for you, it's Butter, so yeah. fat and so on. So that's the simpler question. To address that, actually, funny enough, foie gras is really good for you. It's um, Yes, it's high in fat, as in similarly to butter, probably about 80 calories uh, per gram or so. Uh, a little less than butter, but similar. <clears throat> but it's a very good form of fat. It's the good cholesterol and it's good fat. And that stems from the fact that the ducks are fed with uh, corn. And so it's a very healthy form of fat. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there were studies done, something known as the French paradox, which most people associate with wine but actually stems from foie gras. And really? the question was asked, why is it the people in Gascony, in Southwest France, right. who eat more foie gras than anywhere else in the world, by far, have lower cardiovascular disease than anywhere else? Now, some answers could be genetics and, and so on, but clearly there have been studies done that people who consume high quantities of foie gras and foie gras duck have no very, very low history of culinary disease. So, so, so for guys, probably not nearly as bad for you as you might, or even possibly good for you as people might imagine. So yes, there's fat in it, but it's a much healthier form of fat than let's say butter and, or beef fat and so on. So that's actually, and duck itself is very heart healthy. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, all the fats in the skin, it doesn't marble. Um, as far as foie gras and the raising of it, um, I actually wrote a book called Foie Gras Passion back in, uh, which was published in 2000. And, um, and the book is an interesting book in a sense that the first half is dedicated to research, researching the history of foie gras, all the way back to the days of the pharaohs, um, going to you know, hieroglyphics on, on uh, pyramids and museums and historical documents and so on. And the second half includes 80 recipes from some of the greatest chefs in the world. 
And so I've done a lot of work and actually hired historians to research the history of Fuaga. Mm -hmm. And and since Fuaga was first produced um, uh, for human consumption in a farming way, the question has always been asked whether it's an ethical process or not. So it's not a new question. Mm -hmm. Um, Simply put, the imagery of a uh, tube of any kind being placed in, in, in an animal or a human, as it often is humanized, uh, and then food, quote unquote, forced down, seems inhumane. So to the naked eye, if you don't understand the anatomy of a duck or the process itself, it could seem inhumane. And this is an age old historical dilemma. People have been talking um, about this for a long time, you're saying? like Thousands since of years. Th- really? Wow. OK. Since the beginning. So this wasn't since 83 when you guys opened up the farm? Uh, no, uh, because for guy has been produced commercially for hundreds of years. So, so, so anyone would who is aware of the process, who is not maybe uh, understanding of the process, is going to ask that question. Uh, Rashi, who was a very famous Jewish philosopher in the 1800s, questioned it. So, so there are documents, historical documents about it. Now. I'll go to the end, which is time and time and time again, professionals have chimed in saying, yes, we understand the concern, we understand the imagery, but when you look at the anatomy and you and you look at the physics of the duck and its, its well-being, you find that there are no issues of stress, pain, disease, and so on. As a matter of fact, if you go to the bottom line, which is mortality, the mortality on on on, on in our farm anyway, and, and, and this is true pretty much across, you mentioned good farms and bad farms, and, and you're right, there are good farms and bad farms, but you know, let's talk about the process itself, which is the same everywhere, um, for the most part. And we're talking garbage, but... Right, the, 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 now there are, there are farms that individually cage ducks. Um, uh, we don't, we never have, we don't. We don't believe that's the right thing to do. And that is something you can point to as a whether is that humane or not humane to cage duck, we don't. But everybody feeds at the end of the day in the same manner. You know, a bit more carefully, a bit less carefully, but in the same manner. Um, there is no other way to produce foie gras. Uh, there has never been, not in thousands of years. And but as opposed, there is no other way other than gavage or hand feeding or what some people call force feeding. Now, here's the thing. The whole issue with foie gras be- lives and dies by whether the process of putting a tube, whether it's a plastic tube or a metal tube, into a duck's crop is painful or not painful. Now, as a human, we would not want that done to us. And the reason is is that we we have an esophagus that's a reflex esophagus. We have teeth, we chew our food, we swallow it, and we digest in our stomach. Ducks do not have teeth. They have what's called a calcified esophagus. The food is, 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 goes down into the crop and then gets digested. When they eat, they pick off the ground and they'll pick pebbles and corn and, and feed and, and things that are edible and things that are not. They will go into the crop. What gets digested gets digested. What doesn't gets, gets passed through. When a mother duck feeds its baby, she will actually take her beak, pick up the food, a worm, uh, and, 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 and literally gavage the baby duck by placing its beak down into the duck's esophagus and drop in the food. So the process that we do is basically a natural same process. Um, uh, also ducks, so so the calcified esophagus enables that way of feeding. Now, that doesn't take away the fact that the imagery is, is different than the reality. In the sense that you have to ask yourself, okay, that is the process. Now, does it cause harm? Does it cause disease? Does it, and time and time again, the proof has been no, it does not. The USDA approves the process. Veterinarians approve the process. Um, of course, there's been countries that banned it, and that's because the animal rights activists were generally those were countries where Fogal was not produced in to begin with, for the most part. And the general, the, the, the animal activists politically were stronger than their opposition, and they were able to pass these, these things as do sometimes despite reality. Um, and but it's a struggle that we go through all the time. We're facing a, a battle in New York City where New York City wants to ban foie gras. They haven't even visited the farm. They haven't seen I heard the farm. About that. They haven't seen the process. 
and it's but it's very political. There's and animal rights activists are very strong. And sometimes a politician will say, well, there's so many people who want it and so many who don't, and I'm going to go with what's going to get me more votes, uh, despite of the reality. Mm -hmm. So my, at the end of the day, my feeling is that everybody should understand the process, learn about it, and make their own decision whether this is something that they want to eat or not. The way you can decide if you want to be vegetarian or vegan or uh, you know, carnivore. And, uh, and, and so the reality is that, yes, there is this feed process, but the ex our, our mortality, for example, is about 2.1%. Across the board in poultry, it's 4%. So our mortality is lesser than it is on any chicken farm, any turkey farm. And the reason for that is that these birds are so expensive and are so well looked after that we have a ratio of one caretaker to 300 birds versus wow. the chicken industry or the turkey industry where it's one to thousands. So we're very careful with these uh, ducks for, for a whole lot of reasons. Now, I guess you, you could say that there are better farmers and worse farmers, farmers that care more, farmers that care less, which is true in every industry. You know, chickens can be grown outdoors and in very proper manner, or they can be grown by these large companies that cage them and, and really, you know, treat them poorly. Um, we happen to be a, we were an open facility, um, despite some animal rights activists claims that say that we show them what we choose to show them. And we, you know, they, yeah. they portray us as having underground dungeons <laughs> where the ducks are being tortured. It's oh, an open God, facility. Yes. Every door is open. Anyone can go anywhere they want. We welcome guests, chefs, people all the time. Yeah, it's not a controlled visit. Uh, we're proud of what we do. Um, and again, uh, so the process can, you know, it's window dressed as being, you know, it's it's hard to avoid the concept when 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 someone says to you, would you, would you like someone you love to have a, a tube forced down their throat and spaghetti forced down it? You'd say no, this is not something I would like to see done, and that's how it's portrayed. But that's com that's very far from the reality of a duck's anatomy and the process that's being done, which has been done for literally five thousand years. And so I've seen footage. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, that's. Oh, really... I was just gonna say I've I've seen footage of uh, of your farm and it, it it looks like and correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, but it looks like you they have plenty of space to move around, wiggle around. Um, even when they get quite large toward the ends of their lives, uh, it looks like they have the opportunity when they when they do so choose to kind of flop around. Uh, you know. So sure. Well, they're looks... never individually caged. Um, it it towards the last. Oh, you asked me about the cycle. So basically, yeah. we we breed these these particular ducks. It's a male Muscovy and a female Pekin. The okay. uh, when you breed those two breeds, the offshoot would be a Moulard, M O U L A R D, which comes from the French word for mule because it's a mule duck that doesn't reproduce. So we produce these ducks literally for frog production. Uh, they're flightless ducks. Um, the Muscovy oh, really? is a wild. The Muscovy is a wild breed. The Pekin is a domesticated breed. And the the, the Muscovy and the, the Muscovy is the male, the Bikin is the female. The breed is a Moulard. We um, we then place those baby chicks in in nursery in a nursery for four weeks, where it's a completely open barn. There's no fences, there's no cages, there's no, and they roam around on on wood shavings. They eat, they drink. After that four week period, they move to another barn for eight weeks. Uh, uh, and again, completely open barns, no pens, no cages, and they roam around and they eat and they go outdoors and indoors. And at that point, they're 12 weeks old. Um, just to give you an idea, your average chicken that you would buy in a supermarket, your average duck is somewhere in the neighborhood of eight, nine weeks old. People sometimes think that chickens or ducks are a year old by the time you actually eat them, and they're not. Your average three and a half pound chicken is about eight weeks old. Your average five pound duck is about nine weeks old. Oh, so wow. these are actually older than your average Pekin duck produced by maple leaf or others. Um, so now the duck is 12 weeks old. Now it gets placed into a pen. So so they've been free roaming for the first 12 weeks. Now, now this is the, the most confined they're ever going to be, which is in a pen where every pen holds 10 ducks in plenty of room, which is governed by the, the governmental standards. Um, and they are placed in that pen for 10 days and they'll be fed twice a day 
for 21 days. That's the entire process of gavage or hand feeding. Okay. So they'll be placed in those pens, they'll be fed for 21 days, twice a day, um, and each feeding is about three or four seconds. So the entire process is 21 days, twice a day, three, four seconds per feed. There's some imaginary thought that they're hooked to some kind of a auger and are fed all day long. That's not the case. It's three, they're fed by very capable feeders who actually gauge the quantity of feed that the duck can handle and so on. And that's a 21 day process. So at that point, they're gonna be about 15 weeks old. And at that point, they'll move to the processing plant. And uh, that would be the end of a pretty nice journey. Yeah, so gavage only takes place. Um, I don't know if I could use it in that, that type of sentence, but it, gavage only takes place the last 21 days of the animal's life. That's an exactly proper way to put it, yes. Oh, the, right the, 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 gavage, the gavage or the hand feeding process is starts at week um, 15 or 16. So four weeks in nursery, sorry, four weeks in nursery, eight weeks in growing. Okay. So now that that's 12 weeks old. At that point, they'll be moved to the gavage building. They'll be placed in pens and they'll be fed by the same feeder. Every feeder gets a group of 350 ducks. And that, so that there's, so the, it sounds funny, but the feeder actually gets to know the ducks and the ducks know the feeder. And, uh-huh. and, and, and the feeder is actually paid by, and this was almost held against us, but by the, the less mortality, the better the ducks are, the more the feeder gets paid, the more the feeder gets paid in order to produce good results. And take How is that the held against you guys? How could that As be though we you? have to pay someone to not have mortality. So then the feeder gets a group of 350 ducks, which are marked by a color. So there's a little spray on each duck of color, blue, red, green, yellow, so that they can be identified with a particular feeder. Mm-hmm. And then every day we gauge where those ducks are, because at that point there's a lot of value that's being placed into these ducks every day. And the liver then would grow from about four ounces to about a pound and a half in a period of 21 days. Wow. Oh, one other thing that's important to understand Ducks uh, migrate, so they they twice a year will migrate north, south, south, north, and at that point they have no access to food. So they go through a period of of a, uh, called gorging, where they'll overeat. They'll they'll eat uh, more than they do normally, and they have a a way of storing that excess fat around their liver. Us humans, we kind of store it equally throughout. Ducks store it around their liver, and then they'll utilize that fat when they migrate. So the liver has a natural ability in, in waterfowl to grow to much larger than it would at other times. The early Egyptians discovered when they first, when they killed a, a, a duck by accident or by not, that the livers prior to migration were much larger and much tastier than <laughs> they were later on, which is how the whole process of foie gras production started. This is like the ducks over the Nile. Just observation. So, what's that? Do they started from observation? They just realized that these ducks right. were like naturally gorging themselves. The livers were getting bigger. Let's do this on purpose now, sort of. Exactly. That's like everything else in, in agriculture, yeah. sort of. And so they noticed that the liver was larger, tastier, and then it became a form of agriculture. And so ducks have a natural ability to store fat around the liver, which we humans don't. So the liver, if you were to stop the feeding, let's say at that 21 day point, if you, you have two options, one is to send the duck to processing or to stop feeding it. If you were to stop feeding it, the liver would come back down to size and, and the duck would be happily ever after. So it's not a fatty liver, it's not a diseased liver, as been said, and so on. Um, so basically at that point, as we said, a feeder will uh, get a group of ducks, feed them for 21 days, twice a day for about three to six seconds, depending on on the day of production. The, the longer you get to the 21 day period, the more feed that they get and a little bit lengthier is the time. And then on day 21, 22, 23, depending on the, uh, each duck, uh, they go to the, they, they go to the processing plant and, uh, and then hopefully a few days later to your show. <laughs> or one of the, the thousands of uh, fantastic restaurants in New York. And speaking of which, 
is th this ban has been, uh, been they've been trying to ban foie gras in New York for what three years or something like that for a while. Well, right? here, the history of banning is uh, that that's a whole deep they history. First started, they, they first started in the city of Chicago and the city council passed a similar law in New York. For a couple of years, it was banned in the city limits of Chicago, uh, and then it was reversed. And now Chicago is normal. Then California went back and forth, back and forth. Now the state of California does not allow production or the selling of foie gras. Then, but you can bring it in, right? No, well, like they, they we can... can send it to a consumer, but a restaurant oh. can't sell it. By wow. law, a hmm. restaurant can't sell foie gras in California, nor can you produce foie gras in California. Sonoma foie gras went under. I watched a whole documentary about that. That was sad. Right. Yeah. yeah. And now the city council of New York, uh, about two years ago, passed a law that um, that in a year and a half, in, in, in I believe it's November of 2022, you will not be able to serve foie gras in New York City. Now, that's being uh, fought by the state of New York. As a matter of fact, Governor Cuomo either has signed or is about to sign uh, uh, a letter to the city of New York saying that as far as the state of New York is concerned, that's not a legal process. That the city of New York cannot ban a product that's approved by the state of New York. It's anti-commerce, anti-agricultural New York laws, blah, blah, blah. So there's a pending legal battle over the next year and a half as to what the future of a guy in New York City will be like. Now, unlike California, this is a city regulation. It does not discuss or, or have any um, input on the processing of foie gras, on, on the growing or raising of So your operation is going to be safe, just potential loss of clientele if things go south. Yes. It, well, it's, it's both the, you know, New York is probably the strongest foie gras market in the United States, especially after we lost California for now. And so the com it's a combination of both the business loss of New York City and, of course, all these chefs like you know, Daniel Boulou and Jean-Georges and, and, and so on and so on, who, who uh, love using foie gras. And, and it's also the precedent that's very difficult for us. I mean, first of all, it makes us feel like we're doing something wrong when we know we're not. And so from an ego standpoint, it hurts. But it's also a bad precedent. You don't know if Miami or Boston or anyone else is going to be next. And slowly our marketplace is shrinking. Um, we do, we have both, we have farms both in New York and in Canada. Um, we sell obviously throughout North America, Mexico, United States, Canada, and we also export a great deal to China, Taiwan, Japan, um, Singapore. So, so it's more than New York. So we'll we'll gotcha. survive. So you'll, that okay, way. good, good. And so, as far as can, your consumer business goes on your website, could I send people from my audience interested in purchasing foie gras, like say they live internationally in Poland, would they be able to get foie gras from you guys? No, that would be tricky. Um, tricky. The reason that would be tricky is when we do send export, it's by boat in large frozen containers. Oh, okay. Um, or so. Uh, generally, too, uh, in the rest of the world, there's easier access. If you're in Poland, you're going to be able to get Hungarian foie gras. I know Poland okay. was just an example, but um, yeah, anywhere in Europe, uh, anywhere in Europe, you have access to foie gras from Hungary, from France, which is good quality, relatively inexpensive, and so on. In Asia, too, there's a fair amount of our foie gras as well as, as, as European foie gras. But in the United States, uh, yes, in the U.S., anyone who goes to HudsonValleyFoieGras.com uh, can, can order online. Um, internationally, it's, it's trickier. Gotcha. But, okay, but they probably do have access if they just look a little look hard enough. Well, guys, I mean, we covered a lot of really great stuff here. I think most of my questions that I'm reading right now got answered. Is there anything you think I'm missing? Anything you guys want to talk about in particularly? Or um, Yes, we uh, do not raise these ducks for the foie gras alone. As a matter of fact, the way we make a living is by really utilizing 100% of what we are allowed to use. And... Um, and you can almost say that the foie gras is our break even in a sense, and that our the company's profit comes from everything else. And everything else is hugely popular, maybe even more so than the foie gras. So when you look at this duck, we utilize 100% of it to, to the extent that you wouldn't imagine. For example, um, 
you know, the marquee product, of course, is the foie gras. But then you've, the next thing you have is the magret. Uh, magret, which is M-A-G-R-E-T, is the uh, is the breast of the foie gras duck. And it's oh. a very different breast than regular ducks. There you go. Got one right here. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. cool. This is, this is different than the breast of a regular duck. How so? Beco well, in a sense that it comes off a foie gras duck, which is a much bigger... That's so as we said, reg your regular ducks are about nine weeks old. Okay. The foie gras ducks are 15, 16 weeks old. So it's a much larger breast. It's, mu it's much more steak-like in appearance. And it's much more steak-like in flavor. You see, it's a very red, very rich. Yep. And is that a Rohan or a uh, Magray? Um, it says boneless duck breast. It doesn't spe specify. But that, I that, can tell you right now, it's quite large. <laughs> okay. 12 ounce. It, that might be actually the breast of our Hudson Valley duck, which oh, is okay. not a foie gras duck. It's a duck gotcha. that has not been fed for foie gras. Um, the Magray is about a pound per side, All right. and it's got a big, thick layer of fat. It's very meaty. If you were to take the skin off and cook it, you would think it's a sirloin. It looks like a steak. Whoa. It's, <laughs> it's chewier like a steak. It's got great flavor. And so we sell that fresh that you would then grill or sear or saute and slice. We also make prosciutto out of it. We make smoked duck out of it. We make jerky out of it, okay. and and we make a duck bacon, yeah. uh, duck ham, anything that wow. again that you would duck like ham. to get from pork. But assuming you have no access to pork, so we make a duck ham, a duck bacon, duck prosciutto, smoked duck breast, and and so the breast is very very popular. And we probably have demand for one and a half breasts for every foie gras we sell. The wow. next major item is the uh, the legs. Now the legs are traditionally used for two things. One is called a confit. We actually take the legs, you cure them for three or so days in salt and pepper and spices to kind of draw moisture out of the leg and add flavor. And then you confit, which means to cook something in its own fat. So then you would take the fat from the duck, render it, clean it, and pass it. And then you would, once you have the clean fat, you bring it to a very low temperature. You would take your cured leg that's been rinsed and you would poach it or cook it in the fat for about three hours. And that's called confit. At that point, if you were to pour it into a bucket, put the confit legs into a bucket, pour fat over it, you could store it for a year or longer in a cool place, as is, with no refrigeration. Traditionally, that was done like in a, in a home cellar. Um, you actually take the legs, cover them in fat. It produces a 100% uh, uh, seal, the fat does. And, uh, and then you pull the leg out, heat it, and, and people love that. So the, it's very traditional. That's good eating. It's a great product. And those are the legs. And, of course, you also make a, another product called rillette, which is where you, you confit the legs, and then you shred them and make a spread. You could do that with pork, pork rillette, salmon rillette, duck rillette are very popular. And so, so that, those are the popular usages for the uh, breast and the leg. Then, of course, you have the gizzard, the heart, um, the liver, all of which are very popular for various preparations. As we mentioned, as we, we actually have a major shortage in, with, with this whole keto trend and so on, fat, various fats have become so popular that we just can't get our hands. Our, our own production of fats not enough. We actually buy all the fat in the United States, which we render and, and sell to various manufacturers. But that's good for you. You can sell your duck fat. You're saying that you're selling a lot of duck fat. Not only do we sell all of ours, we take all the skin we have, we render it, render it down. And, then, and we sell it to, for example, on the Epic line uh, to General Mills. Um, but wow. we have such a shortage of it, we actually have to buy skin from other duck <laughs> manufacturers because we just don't have enough of it. Um, we probably use twice as much fat as we produce. So, oh. so the breast, the legs, the fat. Uh, the carcass is used for stocks and soups, obviously. Uh, the feathers are used for down. Uh, the wings are sold as wings. Um, what do you the, oh like duck wings, like chicken wings, but duck wings? Yeah, and we make various flavorings with that. We do. Oh, like I never a, had those. They're really good. Okay. Chipotle, we can get that to you. Oh yeah. Um, All right. So literally, the point is, is that uh, the duck tongue, the duck feet, everything gets sold. Um, and now we even do two new products, which took us years to get approval um, for. One is duck blood, 
which is hugely popular in the Asian market. We actually take the blood, we hit it with either a salt solution or vinegar and uh, and freeze it. And that's very popular in the Polish community, which you brought up earlier. Blood sausage um, and stuff? Which makes a soup out of it. Actually, they make soup. a soup out of it. Oh, really? And wow. the Chinese community, which makes like a blood tofu, if you will, that they use for soups and so on and consider it to be a health slash Viagra-ish kind of effect. <laughs> Like, yeah. So that's recent. And the duck intestines, which took us a while to prove to the USDA that they can be harvested and cleaned properly and and and, uh, and packaged properly. And again, hugely popular in the Asian community. So we sell all the duck intestines, all the duck blood, bones, feathers. So these ducks are not raised, uh, unlike frog, which people think, oh, you know, you just raise this for the feet, for the legs, what a waste. These ducks are not raised for for a guy. For a guy, they're raised for everything, and that's wow. important to understand. And 50% of the revenue we generate comes from the for a guy. The other 50% comes from the rest of the duck. So that's important to know. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. That's a that's a really important piece, for sure. In all this. Um, well, yeah. I mean, everybody is talking about you know tail to uh, head to yeah. tail farming. And uh, this is an, a great example of that. And we always seek how to produce extra value from everything that the duck has to offer. And literally 100% of what is allowed to be sold by the USDA is sold. There's nothing that goes to waste. Now, we even have a large line of bone broths now. You know, bone broths have become really popular. Yeah. Uh, these sort of like collagen rich meal replacement type soups. So we do a lot of that. All of our chicken bones, all of our duck bones go to that. We even have a line of pet food that we take the, if we have any extra gizzards or hearts, we either fl roast them or flash freeze them. And we have a company called, uh, uh, what are we calling Big it? Big Love. Big Love. And Big Love is our little initial startup into pet food where we actually cool. sell duck hearts, duck gizzards, duck feet that we um, dry to a treat. Um, and we and we're making headway in that as well. So amazing. We're pretty first on that way. Right on. Well, again, thank you so much, you guys. This is fun. No, um, I learned you, a lot today. You. But uh, thank you for awesome. uh, your interest and your charisma. And <laughs> uh, 